Welcome to another edition of Capital View, our weekly look at the happenings inside and outside the Illinois State Capitol. I'm Jennifer Fuller. Our guests this week are Charlie Wheeler, Emeritus Director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield, and Jason Pisha, the current director of that same program. Thank you both for joining us. My pleasure. I'm glad to be here. And I should note for everyone watching that uh, you are both also accomplished journalists in your own right before you took over that uh, storied program at the University of Illinois Springfield. I wanted to get started with the Supreme Court hearings that we saw this week at the Illinois State uh, Supreme Court for the Safety Act and specifically a provision within it that would do away with cash bail. Uh, we've talked a lot about that provision, about the arguments for it and against it. But Jason, were there any uh, key facts or, or findings that you heard in this week's arguments that really stood out? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the same arguments that uh, both sides have been making for uh, for weeks, if not months now. Uh, but one thing that did stand out to me um, when, you know, the uh, one of the attorneys for the plaintiffs, uh, Kankakee County State's Attorney James Rowe, uh, he started to make his presentation to the justices. And within just a couple of sentences of him starting his presentation, uh, I noticed that Chief Justice Mary Jane Tice sort of interrupted him very quickly uh, and, and brought up the question of whether uh, state's attorneys and sheriffs, who are the, the plaintiffs in this case, really have the legal standing to be bringing this up in the first place. Um, you know, she noted that, you know, the plaintiff can only challenge some thing, you know, a law's constitutionality if uh, it, it affects them in a negative way. And she asked, you know, how are state's attorneys and sheriffs affected in a negative way? Uh, Roe, you know, came back and mentioned that, you know, we we took an oath to uphold the Constitution. So, you know, that that's how it affects us. So from, the, from that, it sounds like, you know, Tice and if maybe some other justices maybe have some skepticism on, you know, the the whole basis of filing this lawsuit in the first place. Um, so I, I do wonder if, you know, when we anxiously await the court's ruling on this, if they'll even get into the question of whether the Safety Act itself is constitutional and maybe get kind of stuck and hung up on the, the you know, are they allowed to sue for it? So it'll be interesting to see if they, they actually go for it. And of course, we should let people know that uh, the Supreme Court hearing was this week, but we're not exactly sure uh, when that ruling will be announced. The justices will will mull that over. This was one of the key parts of that contested election for those two open Supreme Court seats last fall, Charlie, and so critical uh, that people were talking about this and other issues in terms of the makeup of the court. The court now has a dominant Democratic majority. Do you think that plays into this question over standing in addition to the question of constitutionality? I think that's what, what people um, who want to be negative towards the court would say. I don't think it really will. And I have also found interesting what Jason mentioned, because when uh, State's Attorney Rowe said, well, we took an oath, and she said, well, we all took an oath, and we took it to uphold the Constitution of the US, the Constitution of the state of Illinois. And she said, does that mean that anyone who's taken one of these oaths, that any attorney can has standing to, to charge that some piece of legislation is unconstitutional? So I get the sense that they are not really sure that the people who are uh, challenging this law actually have legal standing to do so. And so who might have legal standing? Well, it would be someone who was let go without being held on cash bail. And I find it hard to imagine that if I'm a defendant and I'm arrested and the court says, okay, you have to appear such and such a time, here are your conditions, you don't have to post any money, I'm gonna object and say, oh no, I want cash bail. So I'm not sure there will be I think it might be hard to find someone who would have standing in the narrow sense of the word. I also found it interesting that there was a discussion about how this is going to impact sheriffs and particularly sheriffs when they have to go out and deal with a, a criminal suspect twice. As it stands now, they bring them in, the person is put under cash bail, 
or some other restraint, posts the money and walks, and then the sheriff doesn't have to worry about it anymore. Under the way this would work, the individual would be brought in, there'd be a preliminary hearing, and then the person would have to return to find out whether or not he was going to be detained or let go. One of the things that struck me too, and this did not come up at all in the conversation, it's sort of the, what would you say, in my judgment, the hidden motive for some of these state's attorneys and sheriffs. When people post bail, uh, it's a lot of money that comes into the counties and the money doesn't always get all returned to the defendant. And so there's a huge cash hit that's going to occur on counties and some of them have expressed this in individual uh, comments, but it's, it was not an issue that was brought up in the, in the uh, trial court. And there also was the argument, or I'm sorry, before the Supreme Court, there was also the argument that, well, the legislature overstepped its bounds by saying what judges can and can't do. And I think that one's not gonna hold water either because as the Solicitor General who was defending the law pointed out, the legislature already does a whole lot of stuff that that regulates what judges can and can't do. Uh, the whole criminal code statute is developed by the legislature, approved by the governor, and that is what the justices operate under. Things like uh, minimum sentences, maximum sentences, that kind of stuff, that all, you could argue, infringes upon the, the right or the judiciary to do whatever the heck they want. So I'm thinking that's probably not a very strong argument either. So my guess, and I probably shouldn't go out on a limb, is the most likely thing will be that the Supreme Court says, uh, actually, you don't have standing. So we're going to throw your case out, we're going to reverse the ruling out of Kankakee County, and the law is going to stand as is. A lot of people perhaps have moved on from the Safety Act, perhaps aren't paying as close attention to it, because at the same time, we're watching these challenges to the state's assault weapons ban. Uh, those are also moving as well. Justices agreed to an expedited schedule to hear the case out of Macon County, I believe, which challenges that. Uh, that includes uh, numerous plaintiffs, but is not all-encompassing of, of all the challenges to the ban. Uh, those larger legal challenges, though, Jason, if I'm not mistaken, still lie in federal court as to whether this violates the U.S. Constitution's uh, Second Amendment. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, the, these state cases that we're talking about, the you know, the one that the Supreme Court, uh, you know, agreed to hear on an accelerated basis, the Macon County case, um, really explores whether uh, the law violates sort of two, I'd call them technical portions of the Illinois Constitution about um, you know, equal protection under the law and, uh, you know, it, it's the legislature can't pass special legislation that affects a very narrow sliver of, of the population. Um, like I said, those are important issues, but I, I think technical in nature for trying to figure out if the actual ban itself of assault weapons is is constitutional. So that that question will be more likely answered in federal court where, uh, you know, the question is, is the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution being violated, where, you know, people should be able to, uh, you know, have their firearms and, and, and use them however they want. Um, and and to, to see if, uh, you know, the legislature does have any standing to to restrict that in any sort of way. And we'll certainly have to wait uh, for that decision to be sure, because that'll have to make its way through the federal court system. Now, Charlie, as I mentioned, there are other challenges to this law in other courts, Effingham County, for example. How are those cases impacted by the fact that the Supreme Court of Illinois is hearing this one challenge instead of trying to hear uh, all of them at roughly the same time? Well, I think they're all, in a sense, they're they're in limbo at the moment. Uh and whatever the Illinois Supreme Court rules, so if, if the Illinois Supreme Court agrees, yes, this is a proper use of the state's authority to limit uh, the availability of these types of deadly weapons, and if the Illinois Supreme Court says it's okay, then all the uh, circuit court rulings going the other way will be out the window, Effingham and, and elsewhere. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, there was an appellate justice up in the Chicago area who upheld 
a similar type ban uh, enacted by the city of Naperville when it was challenged. And that decision is being appealed. So as, as was said, the bottom line is going to be, we're not going to know until it ultimately reaches the U.S. Supreme Court and those nine people give a ruling on whether or not the the attempt to limit these types of weapons is okay under the Second Amendment. Sure. I wanted to move on to some of the topics that are, are facing state government outside of the judicial system. System. Uh, we got more good news this week from Moody's, uh, another credit upgrade for the state of Illinois. That, of course, is good news, but not to say that the state is out of the woods when it comes to some of its fiscal challenges. Uh, Jason, I'm heading back to you. Uh, in an unrelated event, uh, Governor Pritzker was asked, hey, what about these upgrades? And also, what about these uh, reports from the Budget Office and the Com Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability that are projecting revenues much higher uh, than originally expected? They said, well, what to do about this? And tell us a little bit about what the governor had to say. Yeah. So, uh, you know, last week we heard COGFA uh, mention that, you know, State revenue continues to roll in at a very strong pace, uh, another half billion or so ahead of, of ahead of schedule. And I think that makes, you know, if you compare what the current revenue forecasts are compared to what they were when they were in the estimated budget that got passed last summer, I think we're ahead about five and a half billion dollars. Um, so, you know, you think about your own personal budget, if you have another 10% sitting around in your budget that you weren't expecting, uh, that's starting to burn a hole in your pocket and there's gonna be some uh, you know, motivation to do something with it. Um, and like I said, uh, it got brought up in a news conference on Wednesday uh, that the governor and legislative leaders are considering some sort of tax break uh, to the to Illinoisans to, to help you know, give some of this money back. No specifics were given, no areas of, of taxation were given but you know, we think about what sort of tax breaks uh, the governor's office gave last summer and last summer's budget. Remember, we had the uh, you know the postponement of the increase of the gas tax. Uh, the grocery store tax is still uh, in effect. That break is still in effect for a little while longer. Uh, so you know, these sort of small tax breaks that uh, you know theoretically provide a little bit of relief. Um, it's interesting though. You know, you, you sort of roll that into uh, the whole thought of, you know, the financial situation is so good that, uh, you know, the credit rating agencies are, are giving us good grades. Uh, so I think there's a line that has to be sort of walked there. Sure, you want to keep your voters happy by giving uh, tax breaks when you can, but we also want to keep the uh, credit rating agencies happy as well by making sure we have, uh, you know, plenty of money in our rainy day fund and, you uh, we're paying down our pension debt and doing these other responsible things that we're, that we should be doing with money to get the state's uh, situation fully on track. And then, and then the other issue is, you know, a lot of uh, prognosticators think uh, we're headed for another recession as well. So, um, you know, what effect is that going to have on uh, the state's future ability to, to make revenue? Charlie, let's talk a little bit about precedent. People who have followed this for a while may not remember a time when the state was actually looking at surplus revenues or what to do with any kind of extra money. Uh, when you take a look at the legislature and the governor, uh, how likely is it that you think voters or, or residents in the state of Illinois could see a tax break versus an expansion of programs? I suspect that there will be a temptation to provide some kind of minimal tax break. Um, but you look at some of the needs, you look at the governor's budget has proposed additional spending for education, higher education and elementary and secondary education, the needs in the Department of Children and Family Services to hire back some of the people who were let go. There's all kinds of uh, difficulties that would need to be resolved and i think there will not be any brand new programs initiated outside of the ones the governor's talked about in in education but the the likelihood of any kind of a major reduction in taxes i think is is pretty slim because as jason mentioned what we got was sort of marginal things i think one of the things was you got a 50 dollar credit uh back from the state 
for every person in your family, if I recall correctly. You could get a property tax credit of up to $300 besides suspending the uh, sales tax on groceries. And that runs through, as Jason said, I think it runs through to the end of June. So those kinds of things are marginal at best, but they're costly. And one of the things that uh, Moody's mentioned in its report, and I'm going to quote from them here, uh, they, they said that our financial outlook is stable. Uh, and it, it, quote, balances the financial progress being made by the state with the uncertainty of the present economic climate. The state's lean financial reserves and heavy long-term liability and fixed cost burdens make it more vulnerable than other states to a negative shift in the national or global economy. So Moody's is saying, you're doing well for now, but uh, I don't know. And I would add, and I always do when I'm talking about the credit rate agencies, I think that they're bogus. And the reason I say that is, what is your credit rating used for? Like any of our credit ratings, if we want to go buy a car, if we want to buy a house, they'll check. And the question is, how likely is Wheeler to pay back this mortgage loan? And then they assess all kinds of different things and they say, nah, he'll never do it. Uh, but in the case of Illinois, our credit rating has been near the bottom for some time, but it doesn't mean that Illinois, a sovereign entity, is, is a poor credit risk in that sense. Now, I'm going to read you some history here. Illinois partially defaulted on $13.5 million in bonds, mostly for the IMN canal construction, back in January of 1842. And after his inauguration, the following year, Governor Thomas Ford pledged that the state would make good on its debt, and he convinced the General Assembly to levy a property tax of $0.10 cents for every $100 of equalized assessed valuation so that bondholders were fully repaid by summer of 1846. So despite uh, going through a civil war, two world wars, uh, the Great Depression, Illinois has not missed a bond payment in the last 181 years. So I th think people worrying that, oh, well, our bond rating isn't as great as it should be. I think in, in reality, that's kind of a, what would you say, a, a, a pretty fictitious tale. That's an interesting perspective. And you bring up a couple of points, particularly on, on what Moody's has said and what other credit ratings agencies have said. Uh, you're doing okay now, but you need to keep working in this direction in order to get future credit upgrades and in order for your budget picture to be even better. Jason, you mentioned this a little bit uh, when we first started talking about this, the potential for tax, cra uh, tax breaks uh, for Illinoisans. But there are still some things hanging over the state that need to be addressed, particularly the unfunded pension liability, uh, as well as boosting up that rainy day fund. Illinois controller Susanna Mendoza would say, that we're going in the right direction, but still a lot of work to be done to make sure that there's enough money in that fund to handle an economic crisis. Uh, do you think that those two things can be addressed given the way things look, as well as taking a closer look down the road at the potential for a recession? Yeah, I think from a political point of view, and like I said earlier, trying to keep voters and credit rating agencies happy at the same time, they're going to need to, you know, fight this on several different fronts and to do some responsible things with the money and then maybe do some, I guess we can call them fun things with the money and giving it back to people. Um, how well we can attack each of those goals with, you know, the finite amount of money there is. Um, I think it'll, it won't be enough for the credit rating agencies and the tax cuts won't be enough for the people to make them completely happy either. Um, but you know, and, and to go off Charlie's point about, you know, how credit rating agencies, I think maybe we put too much stock in them considering we we, we don't default on our loans. We're, we're, we're still paying. Um, you know, I think it's uh, important to consider that as well. 
As we take a look at, you know, what led to this point, we have to take a look um, into some recent and not so recent history. I wanted to move along to the federal court case against uh, some former leaders of Commonwealth Edison, the utility giant for the northern part of Illinois. And of course, this case may involve people that others have never heard of, but one name that looms large over this entire case is former House Speaker Michael Madigan. Charlie, we've heard opening arguments. The jury is seated. What do you expect over the next several weeks, and how does that impact the work that the legislature has to get done when they're continually hearing about things that may or may not have been done in previous general assemblies? Well, to answer your, your second question first, I don't think it's going to affect the general assembly at all. They'll go on doing the way they have been doing. Uh, and with respect to what we've heard so far, the federal government in its opening statements described this kind of convoluted scheme that Commonwealth Edison engaged in to keep Mike Madigan happy. And it was sort of like, what does Mike want? Well, this is what Mike wants. Okay, we're going to do it. And Michael McLean, a former state representative who's probably one of the closest friends that Mike Madigan has, they served together back in the General Assembly in the 1970s was the go-between. And so the feds are saying this was all corrupt when Commonwealth Edison gave people jobs that they really didn't have to work for, people who were part of Mag Madigan's organization, that was corrupt. He was bribed. The defense, on the other hand, is saying all of this stuff, recommending people for jobs, uh, talking to people about what we'd like, and suggesting people for different positions, that's all part of being a lawmaker and for a lobbyist trying to make friends with a lot of people is part of the business. So it's to kind of condense it, it's the federal government saying this, this huge ball of corruption and the defense saying, this is the way business is done. There's nothing wrong with it. Lobbying is not evil in and of itself. As one of the defense attorneys said, well, if you have a question or a problem, you go to a friend, right? So that's going to be the the key thing. And I think the significance goes beyond the four people who are named as defendants in this particular case, because, for example, if the jury comes back and buys everything that the feds say, says these guys are guilty, that looks bad for Madigan a year from now. On the other hand, if the jury buys the defense's argument and says, well, this is just the way things are done. People always talk to their friends. They always... If, if they want help, they'll ask somebody for help. So this, there's nothing nefarious about this. Then I would argue that Madigan walks free and they may not even bother to, to prosecute him. Uh, that's uh, that's quite a thought as we, we look into the future. Jason, when you think about the jurors who are seated in this trial, uh, so many corruption cases involving Illinois politicians and Illinois businesses over the last decade or more, is this just the cost of doing business in a large state like Illinois? Do you think that there's a, a numbness to um, alleged bad behavior? Well, there's definitely a numbness. I mean, anytime you see allegations like this come out, people throw up their hands and say, oh, it's Illinois. What are you going to do? Um, but, uh, you know, I think as journalists, as citizens, uh, as fellow public officials, I think we should, you know, hold ourselves to a higher standard um, and, and not accept this if, if that's a, in fact what's going on. Um, and, uh, you know, it, to go off Charlie's point as, as well, you know, it, it seems like they're using a lot of this trial to set the stage for what they might do to Mike Madigan a year from now. And I, you know, I think one big set piece on that stage has already been set with the you know deferred prosecution agreement that we keep talking about um, where comet actually came out and admitted some of this stuff and agreed to pay a 200 million dollar fine for it so uh there, there's that already sort of in the can ready to to go and uh the federal government's just hoping to you know add more material to that can with uh the various information that comes out in this trial of the comet for Certainly I think one of the something. things that occurred that is uh, to the defense's advantage is the defense attorneys argued that there should be no mention made of the uh, deferred prosecution agreement or that $200 million that ComEd agreed to pay. And 
Judge Harry Leinenweber, who, as a matter of fact, served in the General Assembly with Madigan McLean, I want to say for a 10 year period uh, from roughly early in the 70s until early in the 80s, uh, he said, yeah, you, you prosecution, you can't talk about what ComEd, the company did, because that could be prejudicial to the defendants. So that's not going to be mentioned. And I, I suspect if the uh, prosecution tries to slip it in, then there'd be a call for a mistrial or whatever. And one of the things lots I found interesting too was that when they were talking to the jurors, there were some, a couple of them who said, no, they didn't know anything about this. They never heard of it. I'm thinking to myself, holy mackerel, where, did you, where, where have you been the last umpteen years? Lots of things, lots of questions remain unanswered and we'll certainly have to keep an eye on that. Uh, that is our time for this week on Capitol View. I'd like to thank Jason Pisha and Charlie Wheeler for joining us. And of course, you can find all of our programs at WSIU.org and at our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jennifer Fuller.